Hey everyone, my name is Martin, thank you for having me. Today we, I will be talking about the seven phases of smart contract hacking. Uh, in this talk, my my idea is not, not to jump and dive into technical parts of what it means to hack smart contracts, but actually I want to give a little bit of perspective and try to talk about the bigger picture of what does it actually mean to hack smart contracts. So if you're a pen tester, if you're an attorney, a bug hunter, uh, perhaps working in application security or, or other realms of information security, you can jump into the uh, Ethereum ecosystem and start helping us secure the entire platform. So a little bit of background about myself. I'm Martin. I'm a security researcher at Open Zeppelin, one of the leading companies in smart contract audits in Ethereum. I'm a systems engineer, I'm doing a master's degree in cybersecurity and cyber defense at the University of Buenos Aires, and I used to work as a pen tester mainly on application security, infrastructure, mobile applications, uh, web applications, Arabic 4. And then I jumped into being a security researcher here at OpenSeppelin. Well, let's say again that you are a pen tester, you might be a bug hunter, a white hat hacker, um, perhaps working in other realms of information security, but you are interested in blockchains, in smart contracts, you have heard about them, because to be honest, we have hit the headlines a couple of times. Uh, there has been many hacks in the latest months um, around smart contracts in Ethereum. So as you see, many hacks, and in my opinion, we need more and more security experts to jump into the field and to help us secure the entire ecosystem. So this talk is mainly aimed at you. And the question is if you can hack a smart contract, right? If What knowledge do you have already that can help you out here uh, in the smart contract world and that you can start applying today to start hacking smart contracts? And well, the answer is yes, that you do have some knowledge because you do know which are the seven phases, let's say, of a typical security engagement. And when I say seven, I don't mean to be strict with these phases that we'll be talking about. It's just a way of organizing the talk. Uh, but perhaps when you do back hunting, some phases you might skip them or you might do others. But the idea is to outline our work as security auditors or back hunters or what high hackers in these seven phases so we can uh, have a common language uh, so to talk about this. Well, these are the seven phases that I have uh, that we will be talking about. First, scoping, then reconnaissance, identification of vulnerabilities, exploiting these vulnerabilities that we have found. What does it actually mean to do post exploitation in the smart contract world? And we will be asking ourselves if whether that's an actual thing or not. And then we'll be, be briefly covering reporting, fixes, and retest. So you might be already familiar with these phases. The idea of today is to see how these phases apply in the smart contract world and whether we can start drawing some parallels between these phases and the ones that you are uh, used to, to applying. So let's get started. Let's talk about scoping. If you come from the, let's say, application security world or maybe doing pen testing for infrastructure exposed on the internet, you might be familiar with, with the fact that you have IP addresses, right? You, When you are scoping your work, you will be given IP addresses that will help you understand uh, the systems that you, that you are about to audit or to assess. Um, in the Ethereum case, we also have addresses. In this case, we have Ethereum addresses. I know they are not the same. I know there are many differences between them. But the idea is to start drawing, as I said before, some parallels between the worlds. So we can think about these addresses as ways of allocate, like not allocating, but uh, locating resources, let's say in the first case on a network and in the other case on the blockchain. Um, when you are working on smart contracts, you will not only have a one Ethereum address, but you can have many Ethereum addresses that are related to each other. And you may not even have Ethereum addresses, but actually you can have domain names, right? As in the classic world, you have uh, the DNS we, that will help you resolve from read, human readable names to actual IP addresses. In Ethereum, we have the Ethereum Nice service, which will help you translate human readable domain names like John Doe, .eth 
to Ethereum addresses such as the one there. But sometimes, most times actually, you won't have, uh, perhaps you won't have an Ethereum address or many addresses. You might, be, you might only have Solidity source code. And Solidity is the smart contract language that, that we use uh, nowadays. There might be others, but TOA is the smart contract language uh, that is high level and that can help you uh, code smart contracts in, in an easy way, let's say. So um, you might be, given, might be given a repository with these files, or you can actually find that source code in Etherscan, which is the main explorer for the Ethereum blockchain. And at this point, the engagement will become something like a white box engagement, right? You will have access to the source code, but there are ways, as we will see later, to actually deploy these contracts and to start poking uh, around with them as living programs. So there are two ways, perhaps, of, of approaching the, the assessment. So if you want to go to Etherscan, you can find the verified source, source code there. This is, for instance, the source code for DAI, one of the main stable coins in the Ethereum ecosystem. And you can go to its address and retrieve the source code there. But if you don't have uh, the code, you can actually decompile uh, the EVM bytecode and try to uh, read it in a more, in a more, in like, like, like a nicer way using EVM, right? So this is a decompiler for Solidity code and will help you uh, understand what's what's behind this is sometimes difficult to parse EVM bytecode and will give you a more readable way to understand it. Um, so again, you might have the source code, but if you, if you don't and you only have an Ethereum address, you can use this decompiler that can help you out. Well, once we are done with this scoping phase, we move on to the second one, which is reconnaissance. In reconnaissance, we basically want, want to understand uh, what's in there, right? So we might be given, as I said before, a list of files, and we are not only talking about one, two, three, but many, many and several files that you might be given. And sometimes the names of these files don't even make much sense at the beginning, right? So you we see here like files names flap, flip, flop, and that is not so self-explanatory to be honest. So um, we need to start looking deeper into the files and to actually understand what they are doing. But when we look when we look deeper into the files, we will see Solidity code, right? This is what actually actual Solidity looks like. Um, just a brief example for those that are not familiar with it. It looks like a, no, another object-oriented language. At the beginning, the, six, the syntax is similar. As you go deeper and deeper into Solidity, you might start seeing uh, several differences with other languages. But again, the first look of Solidity looks like another object-oriented language. But if you go to actual files, to actual Solidity files, uh, today being using Ethereum, you will see that sometimes developers uh, are not that clear with their intentions of the code, and you will see that functions uh, have weird names, some variable names are not that clear, and you cannot make much sense out of uh, the things that you are reading in the code, right? So it might be a bit disorganized or repetitive, or the function names might not be the best, as we see in these cases. But luckily, there are tools and there are things that we can start doing in this reconnaissance phase that we can help us uh, get more familiar with the code, understand what it's trying to do. So in this case, what we want is uh, we want to understand the architecture, the interactions between the contracts. We want to see where the contracts expose functions because we need to use them as entry point for attacks. We need to see the inheritance chains of this contract and many other things, right? But I want to make a special point on intention. We as, uh, let's say, auditors or backhunters looking at Ethereum smart contracts, uh, we need to understand the intention of the code, right? Intention is not usually the same as uh, implementation, so we need to find the differences between intention and implementation and actually start digging bugs uh, in, that, in that sense. So a special attention to the intention of the code and not only what it's actually doing, but what, is, what it intends to do. Uh, for these three last points, for the roles of the system, the integration points and intention, the work in reconnaissance becomes a bit of 
a manual work and reading documentation, reading the code, reading pull requests, uh, perhaps talking to developers. Uh, from those things, we can start understanding these points, right? But for the others, there are tools that can actually help us uh, in a really nice way, as we are about to see. So if you want to see some things about inheritance chains, for example, you can use Etherscan, we can use Surya, Slither, which are tools that can help us print uh, this kind of diagrams of inheritance and can help us understand how do contracts relate to each other in a code base. Uh, Slither, that is a static analyzer, can also help us uh, see which are the exposed functions of a contract. So we can see whether uh, it has many public functions, which are these public functions, how they, uh, to which contracts do they belong, and if there are private functions to, in those contracts related to, this, to these public functions. So Slither can help us explore this. There are also IDE plugins, such as in Visual Studio Code, you have the Solidity Auditor plugin, which is super useful, and as you see here in the GIF, it can help you track, for instance, uh, function calls. Uh, starting from a public function call, you can go all the way down to the private calls and see uh, whether in this way you can track different bugs in the code. And another thing that is super useful, that I at least myself find useful, uh, are diagrams. So these diagrams are things that you can actually draw yourself, put together yourself, and uh, can help you out really to find uh, several bugs in the code. So give it a shot, try it out. Uh, please don't go so crazy on it, but again, can help you uh, understand the relationships between different contracts and functions and dynamics of the system. So that's about it with reconnaissance. We have seen tools, we have seen uh, manual things that you can use. Uh, and now let's get on to uh, the one of the most interesting parts, I guess, which is vulnerability identification. So this is one of the main objectives of our assessment is to actually find vulnerabilities in the code. And if you're a beginner with it, uh, I wouldn't recommend you to start trying to hack smart contracts in crazy new ways. I would suggest that you start with the basics. So you might read uh, the Master in Ethereum book, you can read online databases of known attacks. We have the SWC registry, which classifies vulnerabilities and with different test cases. Uh, of course, not all vulnerabilities, not all weaknesses in smart contracts, but the most common ones uh, are there and you can go ahead and read them and start learning which are the basics of smart contract security. But if you like uh, learning with as playing, uh, like learning by doing, you can play the Ethernode by Open Zeppelin, which is a kind of a capture the flag challenge, a set of challenges actually, and it's super fun and can help you understand how to hack smart contracts and learn about security in that way. One thing that also uh, always uh, surfaces when we talk about vulnerability identification in smart contracts is this difference between automated and manual work, right? I think this also happens in, for instance, application security, where, where you might have like scanners that can help you out uh, identify vulnerabilities in an application, uh, but all, uh, also people or pen testers, hackers tend to also do some manual work. So I guess it's always uh, about complementing the automated and manual work. You shouldn't lean fully lean towards one another, but doing both automated and manual uh, uh, work to, to find out these vulnerabilities. Uh, so in the automated uh, realm, we find many tools that can help us out in Ethereum uh, for smart contracts in Solidity, or perhaps you don't even need for some of these tools, the, the source code, you can only have the EVM, EVM bytecode. We have a Slither, Mantic, Orekid, Nami, Thrillberry, Solpacale, and many more. Uh, I won't dive deeper into this. The, the program analysis world is extremely interesting and it's a whole world on its own. The idea of this talk is just to briefly uh, present them. Uh, and to also mention that, of course, the automated tools, we, while they are good, they might have bugs, right? They might not always work as expected. They might produce false positive and they may not even find mo the most critical bugs. 
Uh, so last year we ended up publishing a post when we found a critical vulnerability in the MakerDAO contracts. Uh, and we realized that many of the tools weren't capable of finding that, that type of bug. Uh, and the forum post became really interesting with when the, um, the authors of these tools jumped in and started explaining the improvements that they were applying in the tools to actually find the bug. And I think that right now, many of these tools are already capable of finding the, this bug that we found uh, at Maker. So the automated tool world is, is always moving forward and coming up with new ways of finding vulnerabilities, and that's super cool. But also we do manual work, right? In this case, we focus on the business logic and the intention of the code. And this actually means that, uh, at, least in it, at least in my experience, um, most of the most critical bugs that I have found in smart contracts come actually from business logic uh, and not from let's say, solidity common patterns. So by understanding the business logic of the contracts, you can actually start uh, highlighting these differences between implementation and intention and start coming up with uh, different attack vectors to break the contract. Uh, a special care should be paid to sensitive functions. And when I, mean, when I say sensitive, I mean functions that may have convoluted and mixed logic, functions that, uh, let's say, handle decimals, array signatures, which are usually not so straightforward to do in, in, in Solidity. So usually developers need to come, on, come with different hacks to, to implement, let's say, handling decimals. So uh, there might be bugs there, dangerous math, um, fu functions making external calls to untrusted contracts is also uh, something that we should be paying attention to. And uh, use of assembly or low-level calls in Solidity is usually uh, a good source of vulnerabilities that I have seen uh, in my years doing, doing a smart contract audit. So again, some of these are really important things that we should be paying attention to when we are assessing smart contracts in a manual way. Uh, but there are more, right? So we can also pay attention to the interactions with external dependencies. And in this case, let's say other protocols, price oracles, decentralized exchanges are points of interaction that uh, sometimes can trigger different dynamics, different functionalities or unexpected things in the, in the system that we are trying to break. Uh, another thing to, to pay attention to is the impact of these dynamics, of novel dynamics, extreme and expected ones that perhaps the developers didn't take into account with, when they were developing the system and we uh, should be paying attention to. So for instance, uh, flash loans have been the big new thing recently in DeFi and Ethereum. And with, with the introduction of flash loans, we have found that uh, Many projects ended up having problems in their dynamics, in their incentives, just because flash loans were available to everyone in the ecosystem. Having a clock network is also something to take into account when we are analyzing smart contracts. What happens if uh, the network is highly congested and transactions cannot go through? Uh, what happens if the price of ETH goes down uh, by half? Uh, and how would this project that I'm analyzing would react to that. And another cool thing going on right now in Ethereum is front running, back running, and transaction ordering. So there are lots of bots right now in mainnet uh, playing with front running and back running. And these are things, uh, really interesting things that we should also take into account if we are trying to find vulnerabilities, right? How would the project, the contract we are seeing reacts to these kind of things? Well, once we have uh, found vulnerabilities, it's time for us to exploit them, right? Another fun part uh, of, in, of doing security research is actually exploit the things that we found. To do exploiting, what we want is actually first to have a reproducible, reproducible attack vector, and that means uh, have some way of sharing with the client, sharing with the bug bounty report that we are about to submit, that we have a reproducible attack vector and we are proving actually that there is a vulnerability and that can be exploited under a certain scenario, right? And we also need to understand the impact that this uh, ex actually exploiting this would have in the system. And for the impact, 
the, to be honest, we usually also need to see uh, to, uh, or to actually to understand how would the system uh, work and how the system react to our exploit and what is the actual impact in the business logic of the system, right? So we need some knowledge, uh, business logic related knowledge to the system that we are we are assessing. To do exploiting, my recommendation is to also try your exploits in a local testing environment. You shouldn't do that at mainnet, of course. So you can first spin up a local node. You can do that with Ganache or with Geth. Uh, Geth allows you to have a development mode, so uh, your test will run faster. And with Ganache, there is a cool feature that you can do is to actually fork mainnet. And um, so you can f uh, point Ganache to a let's say a full node, fork mainnet into your local environment and actually run your exploits as if they were to be run on mainnet, uh, but you will be like uh, no, causing no damage to any project out there. To interact with nodes, you can use, if you are uh, hacking on JavaScript, you can use Web3.js or Ethers, but I think that Web3 is also available for Python. And if you are wanting to do bigger things uh, that perhaps uh, it would be too difficult to only to only do with with 3CS or with ethers. You can use Biddler or Truffle, which are kind of frameworks or task task runners that can help you uh, do more crazy and bigger things uh, with your exploits. These are the, the ones that I personally use and the ones I, I recommend. But of course, there might be others out in the space that can help you out too. If you want to see some exploit examples, actually using some of the tools that I just mentioned, we have published uh, in the Open Zeppelin GitHub repository uh, an exploit for the uh, Uniswap vulnerability that was found by another auditing company, by Consensus Diligence, last year, and that we ended up publishing uh, a proof of concept exploit on how that vulnerability would can be exploited for some kind of tokens in Uniswap pools. Um, and the exploit is readily available there and it's public and for you to uh, see and run it in your local machines. Interestingly, this exploit was actually, uh, I don't know if this particular exploit, but the vulnerability was later exploited in the wild in some real Uniswap pools. And I have also published myself some uh, exploits example in my GitHub repository. And uh, in February this year, for example, we also at Open Zeppelin published a way to backdoor Nosy Safe wallets, one of the mo most popular wallets in the space during deployment. Uh, and we, in this post that I, I'm, keep, I'm leaving you the link there, in this post, we are actually publishing the proof of, of concept exploit on how to uh, backdoor Nosy Safe wallets during deployment. But also, we have the possibility to, to reproduce real exploits in Ethereum. So you can see here a transaction, uh, an execution trace of a transaction that actually stole more than 24k USDC last week on a project in Ethereum. On mainnet, this is real. And we, the, this, the attack not only was made up of a, this single transaction, but many transactions and uh, caused a lot of uh, fund losses uh, in this project. So you can actually see these transactions because transactions are public in Ethereum. You can see uh, the interactions between the contracts and you can even go ahead and reproduce these real exploits on your local environment. So that is something something pretty cool. Well, moving on after exploiting, we can begin talking about post -explo exploitation, right? So the big question here that I, I've been asking my, myself when preparing this talk, if this is if this is even a thing, right? So uh, in the application security world, perhaps you might be thinking of like pivoting, opening a shell, moving to other systems, uh, jumping around the network, but perhaps in the, in the smart contract world that is not possible or that is, it is not that easy to draw, draw a parallel between the smart contract and, and other worlds. So again, we shouldn't think of having a shell here, um, but perhaps we can start thinking about, when thinking about post-exploitation, we can uh, try to extend or elevate access to the smart contracts. We can cause for the consequences in other components or even, even in other protocols by going beyond, 
beyond the exploited system that we are assessing, right? So in that sense, there might be some parallels between uh, uh, in this post exploitation phase. Sorry. So uh, let's go to an example to see to better see what I mean by post exploitation here. So let's see a compromised Oracle uh, case. In this case, we have a let ima let's imagine a platform that is selling collectibles, is selling these kitties, and you pay ETH, and it will give you away some kitties depending on how much ETH you have paid. Uh, but this platform actually uses the price in in ETH of these these kitties, but uses a, a price oracle to fetch the price in ETH, right? The price oracle is basically another set of contracts where the price in ETH of these kitties is registered by someone. Uh, but in this case, if you can end up finding a vulnerability in the price oracle and you can compromise the price oracle, you can actually compromise the system that is relying on that oracle, right? Because you can set, for instance, the price in ETH of this collectible to zero. You can send a transaction to buy all kitties and you can steal away all kitties in this platform. And the, that is not also true for a single platform that relies on this oracle, but it's also true for all uh, platforms that are actually relying on this price oracle. This is an actual problem that I think that we have nowadays in Ethereum. The more pro projects that are relying on a single oracle or a, just a small number of oracles, the greater the incentives, the economic incentives to attack a price oracle, to compromise it and to basically pound every single project depending on it. Uh, so this is basically what I mean with post exploitation. We can compromise an oracle and by doing that we can move on to other projects and execute attacks in, in, in them as well. Moving on, we have this uh, last phases, which is about reporting, doing fixes, doing retests. And I believe that uh, there are many, many, many similarities with the with other uh, information security realms. So I don't think I should dive deeper into this. Um, of course, we do reporting. Of course, we review the fixes for our clients. Of course, we do retests to make sure they they haven't reintroduced the vulnerability and have actually fixed the, thing that, the things that we have reported. So we do all of that. That is basically the same. But one thing that we should be highlighting here is that in, in the Ethereum world, uh, most, if not all, but most uh, security reports are public. That is something that you don't see in other worlds, right? That is something that, for instance, me working as a pen tester for banks in my previous job, I wouldn't have even imagined that I could at some point make public a report, right? Uh, but in the Ethereum world, that is true. You can do that, of course, agreeing that with the client. But um, I think everyone is encouraged to actually public their security reports because in that way we can all uh, improve the ecosystem. We can all learn about the best security practices, with which things might not be the best for uh, some types of, of projects. And also to have the perspective of other security auditors in the space and uh, yeah, learn uh, from from each other and and make everything in the open and as transparent as possible. So we have public security reports, and you can go to, for instance, our blog at Open Zeppelin, and many other companies as well are publishing their reports, and you can read them and learn tons about uh, smart contract hacking and security and research just by reading those public security reports. So that is something that I wanted to highlight because I think it's super valuable in the space. Um, well, and to end this talk, uh, I, I, I wanted to leave you with a little surprise, right? Uh, I don't think uh, today I have, I have covered many things uh, like technical on the technical side, just because I wanted to, as I told you at the beginning, I wanted to give you like the bigger picture of what does it mean to hack smart contracts and how do we structure our engagements. Um, but if you actually want to look at code and run some exploits and try to break smart contracts, I think uh, you might find this super useful and entertaining. It's time for you to start hacking smart contracts so you can start applying all these learnings from these phases that I have been telling you about. You can go to my GitHub repository, it's already public, and you can start hacking a set of smart contracts that is based on a governance system using flash loans and token snapshots, all things and features super
popular nowadays in the Thiefy space. And here you have an example on how that can be severely broken and you can be the one attacking it and breaking it. So please have fun with it and hope hope to get some feedback on that if you if you happen to play it. So thank you very much. You can contact me uh, on Telegram, on Twitter, on GitHub, and all these platforms. I'm, you can find me as Tim Chabate. And you can learn more about information security related to smart contracts in our forum, in our blog at Open Zeppelin. And yeah, happy to, to happy to help you out with anything related to this. And yeah, please uh, ping me if you, if you find this interesting. So thank you.